Well, I'm excited today. We, we started a, a new series in the beginning of the year called Breakthrough. Our God is a God of breakthrough. And we looked at the life of David, King David, where he uses that exact term and he says, God, by my hand, brought a breakthrough. And he uses this illustration, um, a picture of a dam, something holding back, holding back for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden it breaks through and it's not inhibited in any way, and there's free flow. And church, that's what God desires to do in every area of our lives. Amen? And so I'm believing this year is going to be a year of breakthrough. How about you? Amen? How many want breakthroughs this year? Well, several weeks ago when I was focusing and the Lord was laying breakthrough on my heart, I had planned to preach this message. And then last week, we had several instances of a genuine need on this topic. And so I'm thankful. I believe it's, it's directly from the Lord that He is encouraging us to expect breakthroughs in healing. Our God heals. Amen? I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to look at, at a few verses in chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And some of you are going, are we ever going to get out of church today? I promise you. I'm not going to preach through the entirety of the chapters, but there's some specific verses. What I want us to see is, in this passage in Luke, Luke is considered a great historian. There's a science called literary criticism. And it's not where you critique, oh, this is a good book or a bad book. It's a, a field of study that examines geological references, titles of people, and they historically see if the, if the person writing from antiquity is right. And Luke is considered one of the great historians from antiquity. So I want to look at, at this passage and also a passage in, in Acts because not only did Luke speak about Jesus' ministry in his Gospel of Luke, but he speaks about the ministry of Jesus that continued through his church in the book of Acts. And third, Luke was also a physician. So in his writings, there are specific terms used, medical terms, that none of the other gospel writers used. Why? Because the Holy Spirit works through us and uses who we are. Amen? You may, you may catch that once in a while. I was born in Texas. Sometimes my southern draw comes out. Sometimes I'll say, oh, or eight. But God uses who we are. He doesn't transform the the, all the little idiosyncrasies of who we are when he speaks through us or uses us. And I like that. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. So let's dive in. I want you to look at Luke chapter 5, and let's begin with verse 17. This is a great story. All of us love this story. It's Jesus he healing a paralytic, and his friends drop him in through the roof. Let's look at verse 7, or let's start with verse 16. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. The reason I added that to this passage, or wanted to read that included in this passage, is because if we are to minister to the world, we have to first spend time at the feet of Jesus. We have to spend time in prayer. David, we talked about it last week. 
He inquired of God. He didn't just run out into battle against the Philistines and say, well, God's going to give us a victory. He inquired of God, and what God spoke to him to do, he was obedient and did what God told him to do. Church, that's a great example of what will bring victory in your life. So we see Jesus here as our example. He would withdraw and spend time in prayer. And then, look at verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day. Now that's that's a unique phrase, certain day. It means that it was this one day, and this day was not like the other days. It was a specific certain day. And why was Jesus ready for the miracles that's going to take place on this day? Because he's spending time in prayer. Let's look at the rest of this passage. And it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Everybody say that with me. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find him, they might find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. These guys had a heart to get their friend in the presence of Jesus. Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think that's something we should have a heart to do today? Amen? To get our friends, our family, the needy, in the presence of Jesus. Look at verse 20. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins? He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on And departed to his own house, glorifying God, and they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. I want you to notice in the last two verses, it says, this man that received a miracle glorified God. And then it didn't stop there. What does it say right after that? And they were all amazed and they glorified God. I've shared many times from this pulpit the fact that, that I'm a miracle, that God did miracles in, my, in my, the lives of my grandparents, that He's done miracles in my family, in my life. He still does miracles. And I believe God wants to manifest that miraculous touch in our lives in times of need so that we will glorify God and those that we tell will be amazed and join us in bringing Him glory. I've got a legacy in my family and God wants every one of you to have a legacy, to pass down what He has done in your life to the next generation, that they can know that God loves them too and that God's there for them. And if they need a miracle, they can turn to the God of miracles. Are you with me? I'm a lot more excited than y'all. I believe God's calling us to pray for breakthroughs. And I believe this is going to be a year of breakthrough. Amen? Now, a moment ago, I mentioned Luke. Luke ties his record of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Luke with his book on the Acts of 
the, the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Apostles, it's commonly called. Listen how he begins the first verse in the book of Acts. The former account, speaking about the Gospel of Luke, I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which, did you see that? He says, until the day, there's a transition there, in which he, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. In other words, he's saying all that Jesus did in the Gospel of Luke, I recorded it. And now, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit's ministry in the church, I am continuing to tell you about the acts, the miracles, what Jesus continued to do. Is anybody excited about that? One person is excited about that. <laughs> Hallelujah! He's saying that it didn't end when Jesus ascended, but Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit partnered in the lives of the church, and Jesus still did miracles through his church. That's why we still pray. That's why we still believe in miracles today. It's not about the church. It's not that we're special. It's about Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? I love that. Luke uses terms that are different than the other gospel writers. And the Holy Spirit prompted him to do that. And being a physician, he was interested in the healing ministry of Jesus. And so he records that. Many times in our English Bible, it's just recorded as sickness or disease. But in the Greek, it's in detail. And I want to look at some of that, some of that uh, this morning. In, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, there's a verse that's powerful about Jesus. And I want us to think about that. As we proceed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. The first thing I want you to know about seeing a breakthrough in healing is for us to understand the compassion of Jesus, the compassion of God. It has to do with God not wanting to cause a spectacle. Jesus didn't wake up in the morning and say, hey, I want to get a good crowd together today. I want to teach to them, so I'm going to heal a few people, do a few miracles, and have a, cause a big spectacle, and then we'll get a crowd, and then I'll teach. Some people think that way. He did miracles because he loves people. He came because he loves people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? So God heals today. Why? Because he loves you. And the devil will lie to you and say, well, you've done this and you've done that. You're not worthy of God's touch. You're not worthy of the healing of God in your life. And you need to tell him he's a liar and to shut up. Now, I know that's a word you tell your kids not to use, but you can use it against the devil. I give you permission. Amen. God loves you. He loves you more than your mom, more than your dad. He loves you more than, than your pastor even, and I love you. He loves you more than any aunt or uncle or child. God loves you in a way that is far beyond what we can ever grasp this side of glory. And it's out of that love that he came and he healed. Because he saw those that were hurting. He saw those that were in need. And it just flows through him. 
That's his heart, the heart of God. In fact, in the Old Testament, God reveals himself as the Lord, our healer. God says, my name is healer. That's what he says. My name is healer. That's what that means in the Old Testament. I better keep going or I'm going to get caught up. Not have enough time. So the secret to a healing ministry today is letting the love of Jesus fill your life and love people like Jesus loves them. It's loving people like Jesus loves them. And that's my prayer, that our church would love people like Jesus loves them. And when we see someone hurting, someone with a sickness, someone with a disease, that our hearts will break for them and we'll want to pray for them and we will want to see Jesus heal them. If we want Jesus to heal people, then we'll welcome that love in our lives and in our church. Amen? So we need to have that compassion of Jesus. And then there's something else I want us to look at. I want us to look at these other passages in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Luke chapter 7, verse 19. Luke chapter 8, verse 46. And you're going, oh wow. It's not that much. Hold on. But what I want us to see is how Jesus brought healing to these people and what we can learn from that and expect Jesus to bring healing in our lives. How many believe God still heals? You should, because He does. I've, we've experienced miracles in, 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 the, in my family, and I could go on and give testimony after testimony of what the Lord's done. But I don't have time to do that today. But I want us to, to look at these scriptures today. Luke chapter 4, verse 38. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made request of him concerning her. He stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. So it was a miracle touch. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Next, in Luke chapter 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Luke chapter 7, verse 19, and John, calling two of his, his disciples to him, sent them to Jesus saying, are you, come, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? They were asking, is he the Messiah? Verse 21, and that very hour... He cured many of infirmities, afflictions, and evil spirits, and to many bl blind he gave sight. Jesus healed those, and it showed John's disciples Jesus is the Messiah. We can deduce from that today that God still heals today so that the world will know Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Amen? And finally, in Luke chapter 8, one of my favorite stories, just a portion of it, verse 46. 
But Jesus said, somebody touched me for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. There's three things that we see in every one of these stories. First of all, we see the fact that the people were coming into the presence of Jesus. And that has to be a priority. You have to desire to come into the presence of God. And church, that's, that's one of my prayers constantly. Is that I know that we're the temple of God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we have set this building aside to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This building is here for one purpose, and that is to glorify Jesus, to lift him up, to give him glory and praise, and to come into his presence. And I want to challenge you in this new year to join me and say, Lord, we welcome your presence. We hunger for your presence. Lord, fill this building with your glory. Amen. Moses said, Lord, I don't want to go unless you're with us. That needs to be our, our heart. Lord, we don't want to play church. We don't want to go through the motions. We want to come and experience the glorious presence of the living God. Oh, come on, church. You say, how do we do that? How do we invite God's presence to come? Well, there's a verse that says you have not because you ask not. How many of us in our prayers every week pray, Lord, fill this temple afresh and Lord, fill the temple of our church afresh with your glory. You say, Pastor, is that a real thing? In the Old Testament, the glory of God descended and the weight of the glory was so heavy the priest could not stand to minister. It's real. I've had pastors give testimonies of people coming into their church and walking through the doors. A pastor gave a testimony and I loved the testimony and he said, it was my brother-in-law and he didn't know Jesus. But he said, our church was praying for the presence of God. We were hungry for the presence of God. And, and the presence of God was beginning to just be so manifest. God was moving and touching people, changing hearts and lives. And he said, he came, my brother-in-law came into town and we took him by the church and, and we weren't really thinking about anything happening, but we opened the doors and he walked into the sanctuary and immediately he fell on his knees and began to weep because of his sin in his life and because God's manifest presence was in the church. Amen. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for God's presence to so overwhelm us that I don't have the opportunity to stand up and preach. And you know I love to preach. But I love the presence of God even more. Where God just begins to heal people and save people and people get up and they run to the altar and God just has His way. It's not our way, it's His way. I don't know if you've ever been in a service like that. I have. And it's awesome. So how, besides asking in prayer, well, the Bible says that if we enthrone Him in our praises, we, we, if we praise Him, that He is enthroned in our praises. And the King has a throne. 
And His kingdom comes when we praise Him. Church, that's why it's so important not to to just come into the, the church on Sunday morning and say, oh, I've got to get my worship groove on. And some of us do that. We just come in, we just start grooving to the music and singing. We know the song and, you know, we're, we're dancing. Worship isn't about you, it's about Him. And I'm not saying that the worship won't move you. I'm not saying anything about you know, it's, it's bad for you to move to the music. I'm saying it's about Him. It's about welcoming His presence and saying, God, come. Fill this auditorium. Touch hearts. Touch lives. Manifest Your presence. Lord, manifest Your glory. Yes. Amen? The presence of the Lord. Listen to what the, these Scriptures, I've taken those little excerpts out of them that we read. It says, in his presence. Another one says, he arose, he entered, he stood over. They brought unto him, he laid hands. He came down with them. They sent them to Jesus. All of these have to do with the presence of the Lord. They came into his presence. I want to be a church of his presence. When we come with a heart welcoming the presence of God to come and to have His way in our lives. The second thing we see, these phrases came from those Scriptures. That they sought to touch Him. Somebody has touched me. He laid His hands. So secondly, wasn't they were in the presence of Jesus, but there was a point of contact with Him where Jesus touched them. Jesus touched them. And church, I don't ever want to leave church without Jesus touching me. So it's coming with a heart that's open to Him that says, Lord, have Your way in my life. Lord, I need a fresh touch. Amen? And... and uh, the second thing about a physical, personal touch, there's the atmosphere of his presence, and then there's that point where Jesus touches our lives. And Jesus also, listen to this, he commissioned the disciples to go and touch people in his name. In Mark chapter 16, verse 18, it says, These signs will follow those who believe. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen? That's why when we, when we pray for people, many times we will anoint them with oil and we will lay our hands on them because we're being biblical. We're doing what Jesus said to do. Now, is it, is it, is it our cool personal anointing? I'm going to heal you today. No. No. We're nothing without Him. But when we're surrendered to Him, He is Lord of our lives. We are agents. His church are the agents of His Holy Spirit's touch. That's why He has us touch people and pray for them. We don't push people over. If somebody falls when you touch them, it's not you unless you didn't have a shower all week or something. I don't know. <laughs> it's the presence, the anointing of God flowing through your life. I want to be that church. How about you? Yeah. Amen. The third thing, in this atmosphere of healing where there comes the point of that touch, His touch is filled with power. His touch is filled with power. When God touches your life, you know it. We see in, in the text in Luke that he categorizes human afflictions and bondage. I told you he uses specific Greek words. And I want to end this, this message looking at some of those words. First, we see the fever of Peter's wife's mother. The word there 
is used for fever is a word that's derived from fire. In other words, she didn't just have, you know, 99.1 degree temperature. It'd be more like 104. She was on fire. There was something taking place in her body. She was sick. And Jesus rebuked the fever. And Jesus will still rebuke fevers today. Amen? Amen. It's something else that's, that's interesting. In the next passage, that they brought, brought him many who were sick. And the word there that's used for sick means weak and feeble naturally. But it also was used to, to speak of the feebleness of personality. And so, yes, Jesus strengthens us. He'll, he'll strengthen us. And, and, and for all of our seniors, one of my favorite prayers to pray for them is that the same power of God that came upon Caleb when he was 80 and gave him the strength of a 40-year-old man will come upon them. Amen? And the older I get and the closer I get to 80, the more I pray that prayer for me too. Amen? Somebody, somebody told me the other day, this getting old isn't what it was all cut out to be. And then somebody else, I think it was Pastor Lyle, he said, getting old isn't for sissies. <laughs> and I agree. So Jesus here is, is talking about healing, not just weakness and feebleness in our, in our, in our bodies, but also in our personality. There are things in our personality that will hinder us from moving forward into all that God has for us. Are you with me? And one of my, one of my constant prayers is, Lord, Lord, I want to be the best husband I can be to Melinda. She's not in the auditorium. You don't have to tell her. I pray, Lord, help me to be the best father. Help me to be the best grandfather. And I constantly pray, Lord, help me to be a better pastor. Lord, I want to grow. I want to mature. I want to learn. I want to do things, Lord, for you that are far greater. And Lord, do whatever needs to be done in my life. And that needs to be all of our prayer. Lord, deal with things in our personality that are holding us back from all that you have planned for us to do. Amen? In Luke chapter 6, there's another word that's used there for illness. And it's, it's interesting that it's speaking specifically in the language of adultery. It was used by the Greek writer Philo for adultery. And what it, what it, what it means is that a lot of times when people succumb to adultery, there's something going on in their life, in, in their mind, where they're not thinking right, where they don't see them as God's precious, uh, that He's our, our, our precious gift to us and that we are precious to Him. And we, we think that the, we hear the enemy saying, oh, the pastor's greener on the other side. We fall into those lies. We fall into those uh, delusions of the enemy. And so church, Jesus not only heals physically, He heals emotionally with the wounds and the hurts. And a lot of times, people that get involved with, with adultery and, and pornography and, and uh, uh, drugs and alcohol, it's because of wounds of the past that they haven't brought to Jesus and allowed Him to heal them. In chapter 7, this one was really interesting to me. In chapter 7, it uses a word there for sickness, and it's sometimes translated, get this, plague. Did you hear that? It was used and translated as plague. Church, Jesus is greater than COVID. He's greater than cancer. He's greater than heart disease. He's greater than AIDS. He is greater than diabetes. 
He is greater than every sickness and every disease we encounter. That's what God is showing us in this passage of Scripture. Using Luke, who was a physician, and Luke is using all these different specific terms saying, this is subject to Jesus. Jesus overrules this. He overrules this. He overrules this. Whatever sickness and disease, Jesus still overrules it. Amen? Amen? And the idea in that word that was translated plagues has to do with also just a beating down, a constant, one thing after another. Have you ever experienced a period of time where it seems like just one thing after another? You, you get through a terrible ordeal and something else hits you and then something else hits you and then something else. And this plague has been a lot like that. In many ways, it may not have been that you've had COVID multiple times, but I believe there's people here today that you went through COVID and you still have issues that haven't gotten back to normal from the COVID. And I want to address that right now. In Jesus' name, I rebuke every symptom of COVID in your life. And I command your life to come back where Jesus intended it to be. Your strength will come back. Your taste will come back. Your smelling will come back. Your sleep will come back. I've heard all kinds of different things that, and, and the doctors keep coming up. I, sometimes I think they're going overboard and just saying, oh, COVID's responsible for everything you're going through. But our God's greater church. This passage also speaks of bondage as well, and I'm almost done. There's several different terms used. Demons, unclean spirits, and evil spirits. Church, that's still a part of Jesus' ministry, and it should still be a part of the church ministry today. And I don't have time to get into it. I need to close. But I want you to know that Jesus dealt with those fallen angels that took the side of Satan, that came against people, and where there was sin in their life, they give an open door for the enemy to come and to take hold. And I, I, I need to close, but I, I can't. I need, I need to... Oh, Tyler, don't shake your head. You're tempting me, buddy. <laughs> AJ, come on. AJ's a good sport. Let's hear it for AJ. I need to close. I don't want to keep you, but this is important, church. If you want to break through in your life in this new year, you need to understand the enemy can't get a hold in your life unless you allow it. Unless you in, are involved in sin and you don't repent of it, and you continue to allow that sin in your life, then you give access to the enemy to take a hold in your life. I, I like to illustrate it with a, a halibut hook. You know, a halibut hook is a unique hook because once you're hooked, the halibut can't ha hardly ever get off if he's hooked good. And that's what the enemy wants to do to us. And so he'll come, and if there's an area of sin, he'll tempt AJ... AJ I'm not saying that you're a sinner right now, okay? But you are. You're not perfect either, Bubba. But I'm saying, if there's an area of sin in our life and we continue in that sin, we give legal right. And I'm not saying we're not saved. I'm not saying that our heart is a timeshare condo with the devil and Jesus. Did you get that? Okay, but the Bible says in Ephesians, don't give place to the devil. The word place there in the Greek is a place to occupy. And it's the realm of your, your soul or your flesh, or your, your, your mind, will, and emotions. Those are the areas that we can allow the enemy to take hold. And when the enemy takes hold, we may not recognize it all at once. But then when we go to do something for Jesus... Act like you're going to take a step. 
And we're going to take a step. Guess what? The enemy's there and he doesn't let us do what Jesus wants us to do. And it gets worse if we don't repent of it, if we don't deal with it, we don't bring it to Jesus. Guess what? I don't want to run your shirt, so move with me, okay? okay? We become like a puppet on a string. Okay? And then we wonder, why do I keep falling into this mess? Why do I keep struggling in this area of my life? It's because you gave an open door to the enemy and you didn't repent. And the final thing, what you need to do, you need to repent. You need to say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry, I repent, I turn from that sin, I don't want it in my life, I don't want that control of the enemy, and I renounce it, it's not of God, and I, right now I reject it, I don't want it in my life any longer, and Jesus, I release it to you right now, in Jesus' name, break the chain! Break the chain. And I could go on and on, and this is an important subject, but thank you, AJ. But I'm going to close. But I want you to know that is part of healing. Are you with me? These people came, and a lot of times their physical ailments were because they had opened up their life and it wasn't just a physical ailment, it was the enemy. And so Jesus, when all these people were sick, he was casting out demons where they had taken hold in the lives of those people. And it wasn't just unbelieving people. It can happen to believers too, according to Ephesians. Amen? It's going to be a breakthrough year! Amen? Worship team, I want you to come. I want the prayer team to come and come across the front and around the back. And we're going we're gonna to close this morning. And if you have a, a need this morning, and I'm not just going to limit it to a physical need, If you have any need this morning, you need Jesus to bring healing into that situation. I want you to come. I want you to come. And uh, Pastor Todd, I've got a new assignment for you if you're willing. Can you become part of the prayer team and get somebody else? And I want people up in uh, in in the balcony too to pray with. Can you do that? How many want breakthrough? Our God is a God of breakthrough. He's a God who still heals. The church, we need to pray. We need to worship. We need to to praise God and worship Him and, and welcome His presence in our church. I've been in, in church meetings where I didn't lay hands on anyone and pray for them. There was such a presence of God that people just began to get down on their knees and weep all over the auditorium. And God began to heal emotional needs and physical needs and spiritual needs. Whatever their need was, God just began to move and touch them. And church, I want to see that again in our day. Amen. Father, I just thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, I thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you, Lord, that you are still a miracle-working Savior and Lord, that nothing's impossible for our God. Lord, you're greater than seizures. You're greater than a mass that grows in our body. 
Lord, you're greater than anything we face today. And Lord, I just ask you as, as the head of this church to come, to have your way, to fill this auditorium with your glorious presence. And Lord, I pray for your touch to come. And with that touch, your power comes. That dunamis power of God. That miracle working power of God. Lord, to bring your healing in any area of our lives. And Lord, we just ask it in your mighty name today. Will you stand with me? As the worship team begins to lead us, I want you to, to just focus on the Lord this morning and, and worship Him and sing to Him and just welcome Him to come. We're not going to take long. And if you have a need, I want you to step out from where you are and I want you to come to one of our prayer team members. There's some at the back and some at the front. And we just want to agree with you in prayer today. Will you come?